Welcome to The Doe, an online business magazine committed to the cause of sustainability in the travel industry. This is Shobha Mohan and I champion the cause with them. Something, a subject that is very close to my heart uh, to figure out how through articles, through interviews with eminent people, how we can change uh, the context and how people in the travel industry and how as an industry we can be and bring about the change. Uh, to welcome uh, somebody very, very special on the show today. Um, this is uh, Dr. Latika Nath. just beginning by saying that you know they, her profile reads like a book in itself welcome on the show uh, Latika thank you thank you so lovely to be here and and thank you for thinking of me for this Latika uh, this is the second time you're there we spoke to you once before on if you remember yes. yeah it's so welcome back and thank you for taking the time out I know you had a very very busy schedule today uh, so uh, just to uh, give you a brief profile about Latika there's a there's a lot she's done and uh, she's she continues to amaze me with the amount of uh, uh, work she puts in into every day she's a well-known uh, photographer and she's actually a quite a well-known figure in the travel industry uh, she wears many many hats and I'm again something very amazing how she can do so much which even ordinary human beings cannot uh, you know achieve in this time no really I mean there's so much so much she does so for those of you listening in she, first of all first and foremost she's an avid traveler she's I mean she's been to so many places and in a bit she'll tell us where all she's been uh, she's a fabulous photographer uh, both uh, she got into art photography which is something I didn't know existed till I saw her book called Omo and uh, a wildlife photographer of course par excellence uh, she's all he is also a lodge owner, uh, independently had run a beautiful lodge in central India and coming up with a few more ideas there. Uh, she's also, um, uh, she just recently concluded uh, recording a wonderful series on Wildcat and she was amazing as an anchor. So that is a series you all should be looking forward to. It's available on her YouTube. And of course, uh, she is the ambassador for Nikon, which is, uh, which is a, it is um, uh, a citation called Nikon Expertive. Latika, let's dive right in. Um, one of the first things, of course, is uh, how do you manage so much? Oh, um, I just can't sit and do nothing. I've never <laughs> learned the trick of doing that. So when I don't have stuff to do, I invent stuff to do. Um, and I just keep at it and I just love what I do. Um, I think there's a term that's being banded about a lot these days. It's the Japanese term Ikigai. And I think I was very fortunate because I was all of six when I discovered my Ikigai and have just stuck to it. And um, I'm just enjoying exploring it. For me, it's like um, an onion and you know, you peel more layers and you, more and more stuff comes out with every, every layer. So it's just been an amazing journey and it's so much fun that it's not work. That's how I managed to do everything that I want. Fantastic. So uh, Latika, this is, uh, I mean, you, you are rightly pointed out that you started off as early as six, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how, I mean, what was the environment that of your uh, childhood that you know, that put you in touch with nature and wildlife at such a young age? Okay, so I mean, my, my grandparents lived in Kashmir. And my mom tells me that when we came out of the hospital and she took me home to Kashmir to her parents, uh, my dad joined her a little later. And I think I was all of about three months old when they took me on my first fishing trip. So that was an early that's, beginning. That's an early. <laughs> <laughs> early beginning. And we lived on this, um, with my grandparents on this glorious farm um, on the outskirts of Sirinagar and uh, very close to the Achigam National Park and, you know, Shalimar Nishad Gardens and 
it was um, over 40 acres of um, fruit orchard so I was just really privileged because I had these Corridale sheep and these Jersey cows and horses and fancy roosters and all sorts of things happening all the time and that was my childhood and of course um, when we were back in um, Delhi and uh, you know we, my father was setting up these primary health center um, networks in Haryana for AIMS um, which is the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Um, we had a beautiful house out in the open and I had lots of lots of animal companions. Um, I was an only child and they were the people that I knew. They were, well, the animals I knew. So that was my beginning. My dad was very involved with um, wildlife conservation. He was an advisor to Mrs. Gandhi from 1969 till the time she passed away. So he was involved with the setting up of, um, you know, the Indian Wildlife Act, choosing the national animals, setting up of the Indian Board of Wildlife, all of that. And uh, Project Tiger, Project Elephant and the Wildlife Institute of India. So I either knew doctors or I knew wildlifers. So I've grown up playing around Dr. Salim Ali, Dr. Ranjit Singh, uh, you know, all of the old greats. Um, in the wildlife world and uh, you know people like Dr. Charles McDougall um, you know all of the tiger top slot in the in those days so it was um, it was just a very privileged upbringing and then of course uh, my uncle was in tea in Assam so my time would get divided between Kashmir, Assam and Himachal um, and then fishing, camping, lots of outdoor stuff so it was just a wonderful wonderful um, childhood and DNA as well. So there is there's DNA, there is the environment, and of course your travels, right, from a from a very young age. Um, so you well then let's uh, now look at your years as a student and your uh, years in research. Now that is the most fascinating, and I think that is probably um, a very uh, formative. I mean, it's a very definitive phase in your life, right? And then I think it a lot of what you learned at that point in time reflects in everything. I mean, from the time I saw you running a lodge, I know how you bought in every um, uh, everything that you learned as a researcher into running a lodge, right? So let's look at your student and research life. So my parents decided when I was very young that they didn't want me to go um, to a school where I was um, sort of in a bubble and sheltered from the real world. So they put me into the Air Force school and I met all of these people who had traveled across the country with their parents and uh, people who were very grounded in the reality of India, which was a great place uh, to begin with, you know. Um, and then uh, it was then that I decided that I wanted to study ecology. Um, I always stuck to that, never looked at any other option. Uh, very fortunate because the year I finished school, Delhi University started um, an undergraduate course in environmental sciences. Uh, so though I had got admission to many Ivy League colleges in the US, I was just too young. I was just about 16 and my parents said, no, 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 we don't want you to go out now because you, you lose touch with India again. Uh, so I stayed in India. I was at the Delhi University. Uh, I spent a year and a half in the North Campus and a year and a half in the South Campus. And um, and then um, from there I got a scholarship which was one of the Chevening Awards um, to go to do my Masters in Rural Resource Management um, at the University College of North Wales which is in Bangor in, in the UK. And um, I did my master's work on elephants. Um, and my dissertation was on elephant human conflict in the Rajaji region uh, because they had just made the Ganga Canal and that had divided the Kobet Rajaji population into two. So I was focusing on that. Um, of course, being at the Institute of Terrestrial Ecology, being at the Wildlife Institute, being at the Forest Research Institute, I met some of the greatest minds across the world um, and, and had a completely new approach. Um, and my interest from very young was on using technology for wildlife conservation. Um, so it was at that stage that I started using GIS and satellite remote sensing uh, data for 3D modeling to predict what could be done to minimize 
human animal conflict um and people were very skeptical about this in fact um we had somebody on the board of uh the inlax scholarship and they actually refused to give me a scholarship because i wanted to do uh, work in this field they just i was in the final 3 and they turned me down big just because of this reason and they said oh india has no use for technologies like yeah. we know now yeah, <laughs> yes, <I> know. <laughs> yeah. um and then of course um several other scholarships later i um did my doctorate on tigers and i worked with wonderful people there were people like dr vb mathur who's been a director of the wildlife institute hs pavar who's been my mentor and guide right throughout uh, mr mukherji from the wildlife institute um, we've had people like professor david mcdonald one of the greatest carnivore biologists in the world um, another great mentor and somebody i miss very much uh, dr peter jackson um you know these are the people who guided me and helped me um and then of course wonderful wonderful people like the field directors of bandargarh including um mr ramesh pratap singh dr h s pabla i've just been really fortunate um at all the people that, that i've worked with so far so let's um let's uh, come to your the the large owner part of it and that's how i know you best right and uh, i think the way you curated a wildlife experience which was not only about wildlife not only about knowing wildlife but also how you brought every challenge that the wildlife uh, uh, faced and um, you know to, to the knowledge of the travelers so that was one of your key things that people should know right so that is what um, i mean th- that's that was what very different uh, from uh, everybody else what everybody else was doing around you so i think it was um, an idea before its time really shobha people yeah. weren't ready 20 years ago to hear what you and i were saying correct and um, i think today everybody is saying that and everybody is singing from the same sheet you know uh, yeah. from the same hymn sheet but th- at that time people actually would look at me and you and tell us your ideas are not suitable and we should leave um so the idea was that people come in and they experience life in the jungle they experience field based conservation uh, they actually understand what communities living on the edge of a national park uh face on a daily basis um and when you come to a wildlife lodge it was to lose touch with your reality at your home and understand that there is a second world on the same planet that you're living in and this was um giving you the key to open the door to this special world and that's how i looked at it and that's what i wanted to share um uh, with everybody because i you know moved from one world into the other with great ease and here was this junction of an urban world with a rural village with uh, the jungle so there it was the interface of three worlds and and that's what i wanted to share with people my home my life and my reality what are some of the experiences that you curated that ensured that people kind of went away with the with a with a different story right they underst- okay. i mean probably they didn't understand completely but they started to think i mean for me i can speak for myself i started to understand challenges i started to understand conservation better i started to understand how a safari should actually look like i mean instead of chasing after the tiger for instance so you know we we had almost 36 different experiences it was all about experiential holidays it was about designing something where you decided how you wanted to spend your time and we helped you do it um so one of the important things for me for instance was uh, the walk of the six senses um and everybody says we have five senses but we have a sixth sense you know the famous sixth sense and i think when you go in a vehicle into the park the you're surrounded by mechanical sound noise and smells um and and it insulates you from being in real touch with the earth so what my walk for the, of the six senses was actually to take people on foot into the jungle and let them use 
one less sense so you you made them close their eyes or you made them uh, block out sound and then your other senses become very heightened heightened and you yeah. start using your instincts to see what is happening so you instinctively know that that tree is the one where that bird is going to sit and it's not going to sit on that one or if a an ant is crossing the path it's going to come to that obstacle and stop so you anticipate what's going on you you learn to read track and sign you learn to um, understand the noises that you're listening to you appreciate the sound of a leaf falling down you know these are things that you don't normally pay attention to and once you start doing that and you understand the stories that are written in the sands that are strewn around you 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 appreciate what is happening and then of course there is the magic of actually meeting with characters who live in the animal world around you so you actually have uh you know intimate experiences uh where you understand that animals have a personality animals are individuals the it's not a blanket uh scientific cover it's not that a tiger is a t x you know i mean a, a, or a b2 or a, a m3 that's not what it's about this tiger will have likes it will have dislikes there'll be food that they like water holes that they like water temperature that they like uh, maybe one of them likes to walk in dry leaves and kick them up in the air um, another one will like running down hills it just depends on what the tiger is like so or or the animal is like and the idea was to share all of this with people so people would know the stories they would start relating to the animals and they would understand that it's pretty much like a, a neighborhood and you have all these families and different families are doing different things and people come and people go and it's um i always say it's like an apartment building and you're getting to know all of the inhabitants of the different apartments in the building and apartments um get vacated and new apartment new people come in and there are hostile takeovers um so all of that happening that's the sort of thing uh that we used to do but we also used to do something called the mogli safari uh which was a very special experience which was um requesting our guests that if they had empty seats in their cars we would take village children in uh to the park and i was very fortunate because the park director absolutely supported what we were doing and we didn't have to give them advance notice as long as we could prove that the children were from our village or one of the villages on the edge of the park you could take them in last minute and you know the joy of seeing a little 6 year old child who can stand in the back of the gypsy and only their eyes are above the side of the car and these big eyes looking around this little sniveling nose and this story about my dada ji told me my grandfather told me that when he was little he lived in this part in the village and he saw a tiger there and then you take the child to that place and say that's your grandfather's village and that's where he saw the tiger and the stars that come in their eyes and you know the excitedness of this whole discovery changes your trip for you and you never ever But forget that I know. So basically, taking them because the um, in uh, in the Indian jungles there were a lot of uh, tribals who used to live inside. Yeah. So the villages yeah. had to yeah. be cleared up, and this is to take yeah. the children out and also get them to understand what they were protecting, the heritage that yes. they were protecting. Yeah. So yes. I yes. I remember that, and that that was such an amazing part. Of, and I you've been you've written a lot of children's books as well, uh, Latika. Yes. And one yeah. of the things I remember, and uh, this is also for people who would be. Uh, looking at wildlife and how it can impact children at an at a young age and uh, you know i know the kind of curations you did to engage children i did yeah. this lovely book um one of them was very well received um it was i think it's in about 28 languages internationally um indian and um all you know all of the other world languages and um it's about a story of a little tiger cub called takdeer and how he got went wandering without his parents permission and got lost and it's basically um you know 
all of the people he met all of the animals he met and what happened to him and how his mother finally found him and he promised never to go wandering out alone again so it was a lovely little like, story like the baby's like the baby's day out yes 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 <laughs> absolutely yeah. but it, the, the it was a comic book yeah is, no it's not a comic book shobha it was actually yeah. a tiger cub that got lost so they're real photographs ah, okay. the real story and it was real oh, okay. you know actual which is why what makes it so different and so special you sit on board uh, of uh, you are you are the uh, responsible tourism society of india as a brand ambassador right and uh, mm -hmm. i mean it's it's something that being a part of responsible tourism society of india we really appreciate your inputs whenever there is something which is being you know which is being you know pushed around uh, I, my favorite thing is to let's ask latika right so uh, <laughs> so we've been in the last a uh, couple of months you know there've been a couple of uh, uh, you know engagements there have been a couple of uh, webinars that we did uh, one of them is of course the uh, how animals are used or exploited in tourism and let me put this as a blanket rule and uh, what is your uh, take on that and let's take them as animal to animal right let's go over uh, animal because uh, in india of course there is uh, there are few but when people go abroad there is that the, the tiger you know in in thailand right that uh, where they go and feed tigers touch them take pictures so why is that's not right it definitely is not right and why is it not right and this is something as a responsible tourism community and somebody who promotes responsible tourism people should be knowing about this okay so this is a tough one um people have different views on um the use of these animals in um places and there are two sides of the coin shobha so we for instance we have animals um like in in places like san diego and they become animal ambassadors and they're really looked after and they're kept well and they become um icons for their species i think that's a very beautiful but for an animal who has unfortunately been um captured or um confiscated from somebody who has taken them out of the wild it is one of the nicer ways of spending the rest of your life not the ideal way not something that we would choose but a zoo like the bronx zoo or the san diego zoo is one great way of of looking at in situ um sorry ex situ conservation where the animal is not in its natural surroundings uh the other side of the picture there are there are many facets so i'm going to rapidly talk about all of them are these animal farms which are absolutely horrendous things where animals are kept captive in little enclosures and they bred for their body parts or bile from bile ducts or blood for wine or all sorts of awful stuff yeah. um and and treated very inhumanely um and those are really that's the you know the, the hell on earth really i mean it's it's really bad news uh then of course we have working animals um and and we've had working animals as a part of human culture uh if you go back into civilizations right to the beginning uh you know you will find the bulls the, the oxen the horses um elephants Cam camels camels donkeys um uh, goats we you know we've always lived with other species this is a part of our history and uh, domestication of animals is something that you've seen always this is not a new phenomenon and in cultures such as uh, the the ancient cultures of asia it's a part of our lives you've seen fishermen who have otters for fishing you have people who have monkeys to go and break uh, coconuts from trees you have elephants that are used for logging and timber uh, we've had horses um uh, used for so many different things you know uh, from from uh, in in england and scotland you'll see them carrying casks of ale and beer you 
you've seen people for show jumping you've seen them as parts of wars you've you've got uh, horses like chetak uh, you know and and whole memorials to to these animals yeah. Yeah. so this is a part of our culture and it's something that's always been done but you also have um a, a equally strong narrative of animal abuse and this is where we need to be really careful uh if there are people who are going into the wild illegally extracting animals from wild populations abusing them torturing them and tormenting them into submission then it is something that must be condoned condemned and immediately punished so when you go into a, a tourism situation and you look at an animal you can tell which of these categories it comes from if there is a great bond with its mahout if it's an elephant or with its a uh, human if it's a dog or a or a monkey or a or a langur in india we have uh, the himalayan langurs which are on the rolls of the government for yeah. protecting colonies against rhesus macaques and they're paid in bananas and they're government employees right so if it's something where they're looked after they're respected they have a good life it's a great place but if they torture their teeth are pulled out their defangs their abused if there are a snake in a charmer's basket or uh, a camel which is treated badly or a donkey which is overloaded then you do have to raise your voice and protect so it's not just about tourism it's about animals in your life and it can be about your domestic cat and it can be about your favorite elephant who lives down the road from you it's about respecting their right to a pain free torture free life it's about respecting their dignity it's about understanding that these are sentient beings with feelings and emotions and pain and anger and joy and learning to live with them and to sh- share a relationship of love with them anywhere you go is being abused or tortured we have to raise our voice and stop it so especially when people come to india india is the land you know if you look at the old hollywood movies the newspapers the magazines the black and white television era era was the land of fakirs and snake charmers and elephants and call the sadhus <laughs> and we still have <laughs> we still have our snakes but we prefer them to live in our jungles and we still have our tigers but we have only 3000 and we'd like to see them only in the wild in pristine protected habitats and we have elephants and we have two types of elephants we have the domesticated elephants that are born and brought up in captivity and we have the wild elephants and when you go into a place in india where you see a elephant being used for tourism please make note of how they are keep your eyes open ask the owner whether he, he has a license to operate um and if they don't please refuse to ride that's really really important refuse to ride an elephant that is trained tormented and used to earn money if this is a wild elephant and you find out about it please report it refuse to ride it and help us to stop further encroachments into wild elephant populations but if these are elephants like you have some in the forest departments um it, that live on the edge of national parks and our government employees that are doing an important role in protecting our wild habitats then please do go show them some love give them a couple of uh, sticks of sugar cane carry a little gourd um, or jaggery treat for them um, and and help their mahouts love them and care for them so i think you need to be aware of what you're looking at and take a rational decision on your reaction to it
I completely agree with you on that. So uh, what about things like shark cage diving and things like that? I mean, what kind of, uh, what about interactions that uh, put you up close so uh, with the wild animals? So shark cage diving is really about putting you in a cage. It's not really going to affect the sharks as such, right? Um, so I don't think that's an issue. Uh, but what I would like to talk about um, is ethical photography and ethical safaris. I think those are very important things. Uh, sometimes people get over enthusiastic about being a nature and wildlife photographer. And they feel that they've spent a lot of money and a lot of time and effort to go to a place to see an animal. And they will cross all acceptable boundaries to get that one photograph, which they can then tom tom on their social media handles. It is absolutely not acceptable to encroach on the private space or the fear circle of an animal. You do not do anything to encroach upon the space of a breeding bird a breeding animal you do not interfere with how a animal is making a kill you never interfere when there is a uh, very young ones around with their parents in the wild those are absolute no no's you do not do anything that will change the behavior of an animal from its natural wild behavior to an abnormal reaction to what you are doing. So no, you can't throw a biscuit to a monkey. No, you cannot stop your car and start feeding a troop of monkeys when you're driving in the hills. No, it is not okay that you start feeding birds with food and then get them used to being fed and become dependent on human beings. So please stop doing all of this. Enjoy the wildlife, both urban and rural, that live around you, but do not change, do not impact on the species and their behavior. That's a very, very well put out, uh, you know, insight into how a wildlife, I mean, how we can engage with wildlife and what should mm -hmm. definitely not be done. I think mm -hmm. that's, a, it's almost like a protocol. And I, I think I really completely agree with you. And it's very Thank well you. put. But yeah. Thank and uh, Latika, one of the things that I uh, always notice is, um, especially in, uh, in India uh, with the safaris and also because you have to get into the national park. One thing I'd like you to touch upon is, what is um, what is a good safari like? I mean, what is a good safari behavior? Okay, so there are two types of people who go into parks. Um, there are the, the people who are avid wildlifers and photographers. And they just want to be in the outdoors for the joy of being outdoors. Then you have the new entrance into the field who are uh, just learning and they need to tick all the boxes on their lists and and as I said buy the t-shirt get the photograph and then put it on a social media handle you know that's that's their criteria and then of course you have the people who are doing it only once in their lives this will be their single experience and they want to go into a park they want to see what they've gone in to see and have a picnic and a great time with it's a family outing and they will come out after that and i think the government of india needs to understand that you cannot use the same paintbrush to paint each of these scenarios they're different people with different needs and the government needs to change its policy on how to deal with this okay so uh, let's let's take them one by one if you're an avid wildlife and someone who's fond of nature, it is about being in the great outdoors. It's about opening and reading the book on nature. It's about looking at the little details. It's about making sure you, uh, you see the species that you're aspiring to see. But it's also about having the time and the luxury of being able to spend a couple of hours or more just sitting silently and watching that species. It's not about going in, rushing in, going there in a cloud of dust, spending five minutes and coming out because you see nothing of the species. You get a portrait. 
it's it's not what it's all about it's about sitting at a water hole for 3 hours and seeing what comes to the water hole it's about seeing what happens when the wind changes and something at the water hole will smell something in the air and lifts its air head and smells it it's about seeing a bird fly away and the ripples in the water and how it expands it's about experiencing life in all its entirety in that moment at the water hole that's what a safari is all about it's about listening to stories told by your guide it's about learning what is happening in this world that you've been given access to that's the first type of safari the second type of safari is if you're a photographer you you're going in you want to do pictures and you're going on a photo safari then you go with a guide and a driver who knows what they're doing you and these people have to be people who are very strict about enforcing the law you can't push an animal you can't go that extra step you can't take that extra liberty because that taking that extra liberty puts you and the animal at risk and that's not acceptable because if something goes wrong it is almost always the animal that suffers not the human being and then of course you have the picnickers and the people who are going for that once time experience into a park and these are people who may not necessarily be able to pay huge amounts of money or these are people who have no great interest in the outdoors but are really city and urban dwellers who are going for that one holiday where they want a great time and for those people it's an it's an experience that is so much more than just a safari it's about that great picnic lunch it's about spreading a blanket on the edge of a river and giving them a cup of tea it's about uh you know telling making them smell the the mild beautiful perfume of the sal for flowers when it blooms it's about showing them how the sunlight comes through the leaves in the morning at sunrise and it's about showing them a oh, glimpse a of an animal very quickly and then moving on to the next thing so they don't lose interest so these are the things that we need to understand and talk about and i think these are the different types of experiences we should all offer experiences and uh, lodge owners and travelers listening they would know exactly who they are and what they should be uh, looking for when they head out to the jungles next time yeah uh, latika we are almost um, uh, through with our time one last sure. question for you uh-huh. i know you have i mean you've been traveling all over uh, you know for photography um mm-hmm. i mean i i've listened to three versions of your best um, shot ever uh, i one of one of them is my favorite and i'm not going to tell you which one is it what is one of your favorite uh, experience as a photographer every cat i meet is special okay yes but um i don't know look so um i don't know which cat is more special but um the no, first one cheetah, one moment yeah i may i mean the first cheetah i saw okay ah, okay i had yeah. managed to go to africa for many many years because i was always in india in the field i spend about maybe 9 months 10 months of the year in the field every year so i never had time to go to africa and uh, once i sold my lodge um, which you know happened in 2015 i was suddenly foot loose and fancy free and i could travel so i of course first thing on my wish list i want to go to africa and i went with this um, guide who subsequently became a dear friend exao marando and exa took me um into the serengeti and i saw my first cheetah she had little cubs and um i cried and my dad watched in absolute amazement because i took photographs and i cried all over my camera and i kept crying and i kept taking pictures i was just so overwhelmed that i was actually seeing a cheetah in the wild with little babies and it was just so spectacular for me that it would, i was just you know i was just crying and and people were you know happy okay yeah we saw a cheetah but i mean here i was going <laughs> we saw a cheetah <gasps> oh my <laughs> god <laughs> so, yeah, yeah that's just oh, one of the one of the many Absolutely. special moments find a lot of uh, photographs in hidden india i know some of them seem to be talking to you so mm-hmm. 
yeah. yeah for, for yeah. those of you listening in uh, the uh, hidden india is the coffee table i mean mostly picked pictures i mean it's a large uh, coffee table book it has also come in a very uh, in a very compact size as well and the my uh, the other favorite of mine is uh, the omo of the uh, from the ethiopian tribes right that's another spectacular yeah. book yeah thank you latika thank you so much thank for joining you, us sir. and it was fantastic talking to you uh, thank you for everyone uh, listening in on this uh, fabulous um, episode with uh, dr latika nan uh, kindly uh, leave comments share generously it is together that we can make a difference and see how we can uh, as travelers we can create a uh, impact create a positive impact on the way we travel and how we recommend it to others thank you very much